we, what, do, what do we do to kill time? When you kill time, by the way, what are you really killing? Yourself. Yourself. <laughs> because that's the stuff that your life is made of. Your life is made up of your time. If you value your life and value your time, that's what your life is made of. So when you're killing time, man, you're killing yourself. What do we do to kill time? When you kill time, by the way, what are you really killing? Yourself. Yourself. <laughs> because that's the stuff that your life is made of. Your life is made up of your time. If you value your life and value your time, that's what your life is made of. So when you're killing time, man, you're killing yourself. You're doing it, you don't even know why you're doing it. There's an it underneath there that drives it. Sometimes that's what it is when we're killing time. Because we don't have the thing, we aren't doing something in our life that's particularly meaningful. People who love what they do, they wear themselves out doing it. I mean, if anybody in here is a, is a dancer and you've, and you've practiced and you've rehearsed and you've danced until you were exhausted, you know, it's because you, you wear yourself out doing it. Anybody in here do homework until you're exhausted? I mean, actually do homework, not just like till you were bored, but you know, and I guess you don't have a passion for homework, do you? But you have done it for other things because you have a, again, you the painter, like Michelangelo, you know, you know Michelangelo the painter? This guy was just, this guy was, was, was phenomenal. This guy was an incredible painter. That, of all of the, Caravaggio is my favorite, but Michelangelo, if I had to have like a, like a spirit animal, it's Michelangelo, man. This guy would stomp around Venice in these old boots that would, would like, he, he wouldn't change them because he gets so engrossed in his work. This is a guy who would, who would go to work and the guy would sit there and work for, 36, 72 hours, 100 hours straight, no sleep. This is a guy who would work so much that he would fail to change his clothes. And he would get finished with some great work. They'd have to actually cut his boots off of him and cut his clothes off of him because he wouldn't be showering or taking care of himself in between because he was so hyper-focused on the thing that he was doing. Um, <clears throat> why would they have to cut those things off of him? Uh, we have this, this uh, problem with homeless people that when you wear the same clothing over and over again, and you don't wash, uh, you sweat, and the oils come out of your skin, and then it dries, and the oils come out, and it dries, sweat comes out, and it dries, and eventually, the clothes that you're wearing, they get fused into your skin. So when you go to take like, your pants off, you take skin with it, layers of skin with it. And so you end up with these really bad sores and things all over your body, which get easily infected, and it leads to amputations. You know. uh, Michelangelo would get this on his feet because he wouldn't change his boots and his socks and shoes because he would get so hyper-focused on working on something that he would, even if he did take them off, he, would, you know, to, to, he wouldn't even take them off to sleep, but even if he did take them off, he'd put the same socks and boots back on and get back to work. So this guy would stomp around Venice with sores on his feet, feet up, you know, scraggly beard, paint everywhere. And if you asked him where he was, he, would, he wouldn't even answer you probably because he had some place he had to be. And this is a guy who, they call him the, 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 the beast of Venice because uh, Leonardo, who was his rival, would walk around in purple gowns, perfumes, very eloquent. He would speak to people with big hand movements. And one day Michelangelo was walking by and he says, Ooh, it's the beast of Florence, uh, Florence. And everyone would, like laughed and made fun of him. And this is a guy who would just, you know, he, he didn't, he, he would shoot, shoot something back angrily at, at Leonardo, but then he'd go right back to work. But this is also a guy who, when the Pope sends for him and says, we want you to paint the Sistine Chapel, he, he, he just says, no. Why? Because he was making a door. He was carving a door at, at, a, at a church. And the, the, the Pope's people show up and they're like, oh, we're gonna pay you like tons of money, make, make him very wealthy. And he's like, no, no thanks, I'm working on this door. <laughs> you know? And they're like, but this is a chapel that's going to, like Pope's, are gonna be elected under this under this canopy. This is gonna be a world-changing place. It's gonna be your paintings as the center of it. And he's like, uh, I gotta finish this door. So they go back to the Pope and they tell him, hey, he won't, he won't show up, he won't come. So the Pope's like, then you come back and you drag him out by force. He must. So they show up and Michelangelo's like, oh, by force? Okay, hang on, let me, uh, let me go get my stuff. He goes upstairs and he goes out the, out the window and the guards are just waiting there for hours and hours and hours and then all of a sudden they realize, Oh crap, he went out the open window. Where did where, they find him? Working on his door. Finally, the Pope sends, sends word and says, Hey, please, please, when you get down with the door, can you come and paint the chapel? 
And he agrees. So he shows up and he, he paints it under horrendous conditions. And there's a story with this. He, he has to build a new scaffolding system because there's nothing in, of his day that will allow him to do what he needs to do, which is to, to, lean, to, to lay on his back and paint on a, on a curved surface, which is just, you know, in proportion, it's, we, it, we can't do it today. But this guy had to build a special scaffolding system. And the story goes that he, he was up there and he fell asleep because he was working so much. And he fell off the scaffolding, boom, hit the ground, got all busted up. And, you know, obviously that woke him up. And when he got up, he went to the hospital. Just kidding. He climbed the scaffolding again to finish the, to continue working on the painting. Why? Was it for the money? No. In fact, there were a lot of, like when he died, there were a lot of debts and like, like payments and things he never cashed. He would work on something, he'd forget to get paid for it. And then he'd go, because for him, it's like he had, he had food, which was optional for him, but he had enough money to buy his supplies and to continue his art. So that's what he did. You know, a lot of people would be like, oh man, if I had his money, I would, then you would never create what he created. Because it was a whole personality together that allowed him to, to, to paint what, what he painted. And if you don't know his work, we're gonna, we will look at some of his stuff in the fourth quarter. But it's just some of the greatest art that, that humans have ever created, man. You know, which, yeah. But he wore himself out doing it. If you love what you do, then you're gonna wear yourself out doing it. And if you love what you're doing, you don't have time to figure out that the grass is greener on the other side. Because one thing I can promise you, where's the grass the greenest? Wherever you water it. You know, if you're, on, if you're on your side of the grass and you're like, man, the grass over there is so much nicer, that's because you're not taking care of your grass. Your lawn could be something spectacular if you would just nurture it and, 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 and take care of it and, and raise it up, man. You know, if you cultivated your own garden, you'd be amazed what you could grow. Problem is, is that we walk into a garden that isn't what we want it to be, and then we like to look at other people who have created a garden and be like, man, I wish my garden, if my garden looked like that, all my problems would be solved. No, if you solve your problems, your garden would look like that. So that's what we should set out to do. What are the problems in our lives? What are those that we have to solve in order to find the meaning? Well, that's what it is, perhaps, to, 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 to look for this. And once you find this, you're going to wear yourself out doing it because there's nothing else that you'd rather do. I'm not saying you'd wear yourself out working a job that you hate. I'm saying that you'd wear yourself out doing the things that you, that, that, that you love. Not the things that are easy, not the things that are going to pay massive dividends, but the things that, that matter. But I don't know what matters to you. You have to figure that out. And a lot, a lot of times it's not the things that we think it is. Like we think that it's going to be the things that we just don't have. And it might be. It might be the things that you don't have. But I was thinking about this during the second period today. So indulge me in this, this idea. If Imagine I came to you and I, and, I, and I had a watch. I gave you this watch, like a little plastic watch. And I said, um, I want to give this to you. Why? Because it, it's, it's valuable to me. And, I, you know, and, and, and you matter to me, so I, don't know, I think it'd be cool if you had it. And you look at it, this little plastic watch with like a, a weird you know, metal band, and you're like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You, know, you. And you're thinking to yourself, he is eccentric. So you go home and you toss the watch into a, into a drawer somewhere, I don't know. And then a few years go by and you take the watch out and maybe some, you know, maybe like, you know, your little nephew likes it or something like that. So you give it to him and you're like, oh, just let him have the watch. And then maybe later on you ask him, you know, um, I'll leave it at that. And then you run into me at a Walmart and say, and I go, hey, you still have that watch I gave you? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Because the only thing that you, you fear more than being a liar is being awkward. So you say, yeah, yeah, I still have that watch, of course. Good, man. I, I appreciate you taking care of that thing, man. I, I mean, you probably realize it by now, but the, the watch is worth over $3 million. Well, I gave it to you because it wasn't about the money. It was just about what it represented. What, the watch was worth what? Well, $3 million. But of course, that's the, that's the price of it, the value of it, though. You know, and I give you a history of where the thing comes from. Does that watch all of a sudden matter to you? <laughs> Probably. So maybe you go home and you, you go to your nephew and you're like, hey, you, you, remember that watch I gave you? And he's trying to dig back in his memory. Yeah, I, uh, I had it. What'd you do with it? Oh, I gave it to my friend in school or whatever. And maybe you, you'd probably try to work down the line. 
And maybe you'd finally get to somebody and you'd find the watch. <clears throat> and uh, in fact, it'd be even funnier if he did give it to his friend at the playground and you find the kid and he's still wearing it. And you'd be like, hey kid, um, uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll pay you for that watch. And the kid's like, no. Well, I'll give you like, like 20 bucks. <laughs> no, I like the watch though, I'm gonna keep it. But do you have any idea what that watch is worth? And the kid, of course, again, he goes the opposite way. He knows the value of everything, but the price of nothing. He doesn't, you, you could tell him three million, you could tell him 10 million, you could tell him a billion, he has no concept of it. All he knows is that he likes it because his best friend gave it to him. And so he keeps it. No amount of money you can offer this kid is gonna get him to sell the watch. Some people are like that. Some people are like that watch, where you're gonna have a watch and you're gonna have a person and you're not gonna know the value of that person. And you're gonna be thinking like, oh yeah, whatever, it's just, uh, and then so you give it away and then somebody else comes along and, and, and has that person. And then of course you finally, you know, maybe a few years go by and you wonder, I wonder what they're up to. So then you, you track them down through somebody else and then through somebody else. And later on you find out that the person, you know, is, you know, it could be a friend, it could be, you know, someone who's now married to somebody else. Maybe that, maybe you're the watch, I don't know. But you realize that there was an incredible value in that person and that thing that you didn't see it at the time. Did the thing all of a sudden become valuable? It became valuable to you, but for the wrong reasons, because you saw the price of it, not the value of it. Or maybe you eventually saw the value of it, especially if the, if the, if the little kid is, is unwilling to sell it for millions of dollars, you can start to see how that thing has way more value than it has price. Yeah. And maybe you're that person. Maybe you know that watch. Maybe there's somebody in your life who is that watch. They could be a friend who like you, did, you took for granted, and now you realize afterwards, ah, could have been a better friend. Maybe it's a family member who did something for you, needed and appreciated at the time, but looking back on it now, especially if the family member is no longer with you, you can't go back and get that, that ugly knitted sweater that they, they gave you. Mm. It comes down to this. What's the meaning of it? Why does it matter? And if we can solve that and find that, I bet we could probably aim a lot of our activities in life towards that and solve that last problem about the things that are unknown to us. To make the unknown known. Otherwise, we're going to do what we've always done and just call it fate. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticism, critiques?